uh, we are going to dive right into our panel conversation and discussion on leadership. And I am so excited to be joined by these three incredible people, um, friends of the show. And and even though I've only met Sadie in person, I consider Che and and Sint friends and good friends. And it's so wonderful to have all of you here. So please join me in welcoming Che Huang, uh, the founder uh, and CEO of Boxed, Sint Marshall, the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, and Sadie Lincoln, the founder of Bar3. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Awesome. It's good to be here, Guy. How are you doing? Thanks for having us. I am so excited to have all, all of you here with me. I just I, It would, would be slightly better if we were on stage together, but that's going to happen in the future. Let me let me start by asking all of you uh, this question, which is, can you do you remember a moment and over the course of your career when you began to form your understanding of what a leader is and and how how do you define that today? Let me start. Let me start with you, Sint. Yes. And it was actually very early. Uh, in my career, when I started out supervising uh, operators way back in the day, guy, you know, I started out at AT&T, uh, Pacific Vail at the time in, in San Francisco. And I remember the moment when I had these 10 uh, evening operators ask me uh, to, you know, change some of our policies because it was back in the day when they had to even get permission to go uh, take a break or to go to the restroom. And I remember coming up with the plan and listening to them that night and you know learning the process and you know what they wanted done and then we came up with the plan and you know we worked it worked it all out i took it to my boss she was hesitant at first but then she let us do it uh, it was very risky but we ended up uh being very successful and our results went from the bottom of the state to the top of the state uh, but it was all because i listened to these people uh, i really understood what they were asking me to do um, i had a lot of empathy for them and just kind of took the risk. I was brand new. I, mean, I was brand new. I was just a few months into my job. I was 21 years old. And that's when I kind of you know, go by these three L's. Then my job as a leader uh, is to listen to the people, learn from the people, and love the people. Uh, it really goes back that far. That's what I actually did uh, then. So I remember the moment very well. Che, how about you? When do you? When did you begin to form an, your understanding of what it means to be a leader? And, and, and how do you define that? Yeah, I, I was on the other side of that, uh, meaning that uh, I, I was being led. And so to this moment, that, that was my real, uh, when I was a first year at a law firm, uh, that was my real kind of a moment when uh, I, I realized what it meant to be a leader. And so you know, we had just pulled an all-nighter uh, for uh, some transaction we were working on. So here I was, 20-something years old, hadn't slept in like, you know, 27, 30 hours. And so sitting there trying to stare at documents and the lead partner uh, that was on that transaction came came down to where the lowly first year sat and kind of put his hand on our shoulders and said, you know, how are you guys holding up? Um, you know, you guys look like you could use some coffee and hot chocolate and breakfast. And uh, and went downstairs, took our order and went down just to uh, uh, to the coffee shop and and brought it back to us. And and I just at that moment, maybe it was me being delirious because I was awake for so long. But um, I just remember, wow, like such a small thing, that empathy. Uh, that someone showed as a leader meant so much uh, mm -hmm. to me being led. That, and that, to this day, I, I feel like that pervades uh, my leadership style. Sadie, how about you? My first instinct is to answer, and I feel like this is cheating, but <laughs> it's true. Um, I'm still learning what it is to be a leader. I feel like for me, leadership is a practice, not a destination for sure. I learn every day what it is to be a leader. Uh, and I would say that one of the things that's helped me immensely as a leader is to learn more about myself and to learn where my inherent strength lies and then to stand up for that and support it in the best way I know possible. And that's most of the time by surrounding myself with people who feel kind of where I miss yeah. and also respect where I'm strong. That combination has helped me be a leader. I love that. Um, che, let me let me come back to you. Um, you founded Boxed in 2013. And by the way, if you haven't heard Che's episode of How I Built This or any one on this screen, you've got to go back and listen to them because they're all incredible stories. Um, you founded Boxed in 2013. It's it's for for those who don't know, it's an online retailer that specializes in 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 packaged goods. It's sort of like 
um, Costco, but it comes to your door and it, it's a really cool company. Um, when you launched it, you were doing it out of like a garage in New Jersey, right? And and of course you did everything at first. You you were you were packing the boxes, you were taping them shut. It was physical work, it was hard work, but you I remember you telling me how much you loved it. But of course, as the company grew and now you're a much bigger company, you had to start to manage the people who were doing that work that you had been doing. What how did you move from worker? to leader it was really difficult uh for years even a after we had raised a lot of money and we had like a corporate office environment i was still uh you could find me in my spare time just packing boxes uh, on on the floor and even today people joke whenever i walk the floor they're like you know you can't pack a box anymore and and i'm always warning them like don't let me get on the line i'll show you guys but the reality is i'd probably be the slowest packer out there today um but uh, it was a forced kind of moment for us and so um uh, I remember an investor had uh, called me and, and said, hey, you know, um, some of the other folks said, you're still packing uh, boxes. And, and I was like, yeah, I, I thought it was a positive. I was like, I, I like to be with the troops. I'm still on the front line. I'm doing this every single day. Um, but, at that, but at that moment, the investor basically told me that um, you need to stop that because for every moment you are there packing a box, you're actually doing the company a disservice because you've graduated past that. You now have hundreds of people in your charge and you need to do the things that they can't do themselves and that they that you're in the best position to do and that's lead the company so whether it's setting strategy whether it's raising more money whether it's uh, working on marketing those are the things that you need to focus on for you to really benefit those uh, on the front lines and and that really stuck with me and so at that moment I felt like I graduated out of kind of the physical world of, of picking and packing boxes yeah Sadie, when you started Bar Three, and for those of, of you who are not familiar with Bar Three, it's a, it's it's a, uh, a an exercise studio. It's a it's a uh, a form of exercise combining yoga and Pilates and um, a lot of core work. It's a really cool program. Um, and Sadie, you founded it in Portland, Oregon, um, but you actually decided to expand pretty quickly, and then you brought in other um, owners, franchise owners, who you. I had to kind of train in, 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 the, in the culture of Bar 3. They were studio owners. How, how, did you have, I mean, I know you, you talk about, I love that you talk about leadership as an ongoing process. I think that's exactly right. But when you started out, right? I mean, I mean, people probably look to you for guidance. How did you start to figure out how to, how to do that, how to present as a leader? I didn't. I didn't consciously think, okay, how do how am I going to be a leader? I showed up true every single day. I think I attracted people who were already interested in what we were doing and had um, a, a deep understanding of Bar Three um, before I really needed to train them. And so it was for me, it was more of an investigation about what do you see in Bar Three? Like, how do you think this could grow? What would this look like in your community in Bend, Oregon, or Seattle, or or Manila? You know, how would Bar Three work in your community and in your life? And those kinds of questions, um, I think, for one thing, the burden was lifted from my shoulders of having all the answers, but also it ignited a culture of collaboration and ownership, literally and figuratively. And I think that's why um, you know we were able to rise pretty quickly. Sint, before I ask you any questions about leadership, I need to wish you good luck because you are in Los Angeles shortly after a conference. You are the president of the Dallas Mavericks, the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. They are playing the Clippers tonight in game two of the NBA playoffs. Yes. And I hope I'm not offending any Clippers fans here, but you're with me, Sint. And actually, my dad is going to, I'm a shout out to my dad. He's going to be at the game tonight rooting for the Clippers. But since you're with me, so I I am wishing you good luck tonight. You're already one game up. Thank you, thank you. I'm so excited, and <laughs> it's just good to be out, to be in the vibe. Uh, I'm glad your dad is coming out tonight. I'm glad uh, the Clippers have opened up the arena and they're getting some fans back in there. We'll be doing the same thing Friday, uh, expanding our capacity. So it's just good, really, to be out and to be a part of an industry that's helping to bring. Uh, the country back. So thank you for wishing us luck. Uh, it's exciting. Hope to leave here with the victory tonight. All right. 
Well, Sint, when you were you were on our show last year, um, and you, there was so much incredible feedback from your episode, you, you you described how you didn't seek this job out. You didn't seek to be the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. Mark Cuban, he actually tapped you for your your expertise around diversity and inclusion. You'd run your own consulting company. Um, you worked at AT and T for many years, um, and the Mavs were having some serious problems with culture when you joined them about three years ago. And, and Mark asked you to kind of turn things around. So you were coming into a culture that already needed changing, which I can't even begin to imagine what yes. a challenge that was. Yes. It is It is not easy when you walk in. You know, you're already starting a new job, you know, new people and all that. Uh, but then to come in with a crisis and a crisis that is very public and it's very visible and it's one where you know uh, you'll have to make some changes. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but fortunately, you know, there's some just wonderful people at the Mavs uh, who are still there. Uh, some are gone, uh, but some are still there and uh, they wanted a change too. Uh, so it's not like I walked into a place and 100% of the people were resisting a change. Uh, the organization was definitely in need of a culture transformation. And, uh, you know, I laid out a vision that said we would uh, set the global standard for diversity and inclusion by the end of that year, because I just know from my experience, there's a business case for uh, diversity. And if you want to be successful as a company, you need to have a diverse group of people uh, uh, in the company. And then uh, we laid out a set of values uh, that uh, spell crafts, character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety and just dug deep on those values and basically said this would be values-based employment. And these values would not just be on the walls because of course we got our big posters made and all that and put them on yeah. the wall, but they would operate in the halls. And the decisions yeah. that we would make uh, every day, the hiring decisions we would make, everything would be based on a set of values. And then we put that 100 day plan in place that you and I talked about last time uh, that focused on you know modeling zero tolerance and you know for inappropriate behavior, misconduct, uh, false allegations, anything like that, a man's women's agenda, a culture transformation plan, a very holistic approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then just basic operational effectiveness and put a diverse leadership team in place, had one-on-ones with every single employee in the first 90 days because it's so important to just sit down and talk to people. Yeah. Uh, and so we all rallied together and executed on a plan. So as you know, I didn't do it by myself. It's Sin. I want to follow up on something you did because I think this is really interesting and really actionable. Actually, um, you, you just mentioned it, but I know in those first the first ninety days, you met with every single member of the staff, every staff member who worked for the Dallas Mavericks. You had a one on one with them. Yes. You listened to them. You asked about their life stories. It wasn't just hey, what's bothering you or what's on your mind. You wanted to know about their childhoods and their passions and their interests. Um, um, how did you know to do that? And tell me what that accomplished, because it's a really interesting approach. Well, you're right. I mean, you said it earlier. By the time I got to the Mavs, I had 36 years of experience uh, being a leader, uh, a leader and a manager at uh, AT&T. And then, of course, my year in consulting and working with other companies. And then just as a human being, I know what has always worked for me is someone who actually cares about me as a person. And so I learned that uh, over the years. And uh, my first thing I would say to the employee when they sit down, I said, give me your whole life story. And nine out of 10 times they would say, oh, this is my fifth season at the Mavs or my 10th season at the Mavs. And I'd say, were you born here? I want your whole life story. I want you to talk to me. I want to get to know you. I want to know, you know about your family, all that. And then they would just open up and talk to me. Then we'd end up talking about some of the workplace issues. And then I would end with the same, uh, I'd ask all of them the same thing. I said, tell me where you see yourself five, yourself five years from now, personally and professionally. Because then, so I wanted to kind of, you know, I want to know about the past, but then I wanted their vision of the future because my job as a leader is to kind of meet them where they are, but then to help them get to where they want to go. And I will tell you, after having over 120 of those sessions, I fell in love with the folks at the maps. I was just I was just all in after that because I got to know them. I got to know the fact that a lot of them, you know, they came to the maps to have a not just a job in sports, but a career in sports. Yeah. And they deserve a great place to work. 
And so I was all in after spending you know all that time with them. Um, and I, I, oh, could I, I love Lisa, that, yes. by the way. So, uh, you know, um, when, when, when I interview folks, that's the question I ask. It's like, tell me about your life. Tell me about you. What's the story of you? Mm -hmm. But don't say anything on your resume. And you'd be shocked that, like, there's usually a five, 10 second kind of silence there, a, a moment of silence where folks are like, wait, wait, uh, just me? You know, like, and, but where do you start? Like, when you grew up or, siblings and so i love that you did that and uh, i could only imagine after hearing 120 different stories that connection that you have with employees it, it's it must have been really special and you're right they were yeah. so surprised because you know you want to get to know them as people uh, and i always yeah. say the person who gets up out of bed in the morning uh that person the issues they have the past they have the background just all of that that's the person you actually want to walk into your doors every day. I don't want the employee walking in. I want that person to yeah. walk in, all the creativity, the diversity, all that. And then our job as leaders is to meet them where they are. You want that person, not the employee. You know, I love that so much because in the past, it used to be that, that there was a truism, which was check your baggage or your, your, your personal life at the door before you walk in. Your approach is completely the opposite. It's like, no, bring it with you. We, we That is who you are. And we are going to create a space where you can you can feel not only welcome but 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 included and and yeah. authentic and comfortable. Our hashtag we have hashtags for all of our values, and our hashtag for authenticity is hashtag do you. We want you to do you when you walk in that door because we benefit from that. Because we take all that creativity and all those differences and all that, and we create something better for our fans and for our, our workplace. Uh, we want people to be themselves when they walk in our doors. That's so awesome. Sadie, you do a version of this too. You, you, um, you, since you la you've launched Bar3, you hold regular leadership circles and you've done this at the How I Built the Summit and I've been able to see them and they are so powerful. People walk out of those leadership circles trans formed um, where you you openly share your fears and joy and concerns about your life things about your life and you know to some people that might sound touchy-feely or uh, but but at the same time um, you know it, it it is incredibly powerful what do you I mean let, let me start by saying not everybody wants to share that way right not everybody wants to do that but I wonder when you do hold these leadership circles, what what kind of information comes out that enables you to to do what you do better, to lead more effectively? Yeah, well, I like that you brought up that not everybody wants to share like that. And I think that's probably the most important thing about circle. Leadership circle is permission to pass. The only role in circle is that everyone's there and listening and connected. Uh, and then, I mean, we've actually have pr had profound conversations like, what's your favorite item at Trader Joe's? I mean, sometimes like a really simple conversation. Orange chicken. <laughs> right. Everybody has one, right? Everyone has one. Um, so, but it's, you know, and it sounds like an icebreaker, but we add a little more structure to it. And it's a practice of being seen and heard. And you know, what was once intuitive community now I believe needs to be intentional. And holding space with structure around circle leadership is a way to fight lonely and a way for every single person at the table to have a voice. Often when we get around a table in a work setting, there are a few people that have a voice and, and usually the same kind of people who don't. And it's a way for everybody to have a voice in a structured way. And, um, you know, I do, I think it's so beautiful that both of my panel mates here talk to their employees on a soulful level about their life story, because I know that that's what we're all craving. I know that, you know, I think it's sad that we feel lonely at work. I think it's sad that we all feel like imposters um, and that we have to leave our true self behind and show up with our power suits on and be our work self. Um, I don't think that helps build culture. I don't think that helps build innovation. I don't think it helps us problem solve. 
um, you know, that old way of thinking in the workplace doesn't evolve us. It doesn't move us forward. Yeah. Um, and there are many ways to, to bring out people's true self in the workplace. I think just having that intention is, is a really powerful start. I'm curious for, for people watching, right? They may, they may be thinking, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to speculate, but they may be thinking, look, this, this is going to be hard to implement in my, in my environment, in my work environment, because it could be awkward or it could be challenging, but I, I have to say it is incredibly powerful. We, we've done versions of this on our team. Um, and, you know, since you do a version of this in your own way and, and Che, you do a version of this, but if somebody wanted to convene some kind of session where everybody would feel comfortable and safe, um, how would you suggest they start? Okay, I, I'll, I'll just lead out on that. Please. Uh, and, and I think there are a few different ways to start. Uh, I think you start small. Uh, it's, it, sometimes it's better to start with uh, kind of individual conversations because sometimes people are better one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, sometimes they're a little fearful in front of uh, other people. And so you can pick a topic and say, okay, you know, we're going to be talking about this this week, or we're going to be talking about wellness or uh, May is Mental uh, Health Awareness Month. So we want to talk about that and start to engage people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we have uh, small circles. We have things called experiences of understanding. Uh, so when something happens uh, like hate that's rising in our uh, Asian American Pacific Islander community, or today is the one year anniversary of the death of George Floyd, uh, we have small circles that talk about those kind of issues, how they're feeling, what's going on there. And you start individual, then smaller groups. And then before you know it, you have a huddle. And so we have a, an organization huddle every Wednesday. And it's not just covering uh, work items. I mean, anything could come up uh, in that huddle. But it, it, we literally evolved from the one-on-ones to the uh, circles of understanding to larger huddles. And somewhere along that continuum, you will meet somebody along that way and you'll get, you'll get to them. And then mm -hmm. you'll learn what works for them. And you have to be very mindful of what works for them. Uh, our workplace promise at the Mavs is every voice matters. And so I love the fact uh, the city brought up voice, uh, that every voice matters and everybody belongs. But you have to figure out, we as leaders have to figure out how that person, uh, how you have to kind of connect with them in order to get them uh, to put their voice out there. You have to figure out who that person is, how 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 does belonging actually work for them? It's, it's very personal, very personal. One thing I would add to that, that we've found really helpful is for me not to be in the room all the time. Hmm. I'm not there. Um, I mean, I don't know, but I, I have a hunch that's when a lot of magic happens um, because our team is empowered with this idea as well. And I think no matter what, if you're the founder of your company, um, you're seen differently. And it's something I've tried to fight for years and I finally surrendered to it. <laughs> and um, and I realized, yeah, there's really something to that. Like when I step away, that's at this point, that's when the magic happens because mm -hmm. they can hold this space for each other. And, and that's, um, you know, ultimately exactly what I what I want for them anyways. Yeah. Yeah. On, Sadie, on that point, I couldn't agree more. Like, um, uh, so, um, you know, I would just sit on, sit in on meetings sometimes and just, uh, mention some things like, have we tried this or have we tried that? And, uh, um, and then just leave the meeting, you know, and just say, Oh, okay, I gotta go. Thanks guys. Keep, keep doing your thing. And then one day, one of our co-founders like very forcefully grabbed me in the hallway after I left. And he's like, do you know what you, what you're doing? And I'm like, what? I just dropped down. I'm just trying to be nice. But, um, sometimes as a co-founder or as a CEO, as a leader, Sometimes by just saying a few things, the entire organization tries to pivot around kind of what you just said. And yeah. so re realizing that, listen, like I'm just trying to help the team. And sometimes by helping the team is just sitting back or not being in the meeting. That's something that's important as well. And then something that I love about what Sint was saying about leadership and starting small. Um, uh, one thing I, I would just add to that is that like sometimes leadership is about being the first to be vulnerable, not just charging through the door, but uh, in a small group like that, um, uh, to be vulnerable and say, hey guys, like this is how I feel about it uh, in a vulnerable way. Um, and I've often found that more, more likely than not, everyone else follows that lead and says, okay, this is not one of those meetings where I have to put this sheen or this facade up, mm. but this is one of those meetings that uh, we're really gonna break through here. And so I I've had good luck um, being vulnerable as well. I, I wanna ask, I wanna jump uh, uh, off that, 
that point, Trey, because as, as you know, as all of you know, I ask guests on my show to surrender, to surrender to the process. And I ask them to, to be as vulnerable as they're willing to be, um, in part because I think that it deepens their connection with our, our audience and our listeners. Um, how, how comfortable, I mean, did, did it, was it challenging for you all as leaders to learn how to show vulnerability, Sint? It was, it, for, for me, it got to a point where I just decided I was better off being me and being vulnerable. And I just couldn't play a game anymore. And it actually came when I got a big promotion in our company. And I got this laundry list of things they wanted me to change, just, just everything. And it just wasn't me. And I just finally said, I got to be me. Uh, you can keep it. Now, it turned out I ended up getting it anyway. Uh, but I, I got to be me and I got to start telling my story. And so I started telling my story about growing up in the projects, things that happened, domestic violence. I talked about miscarriages. I mean, you name it. I, my daughter who died. I just started telling stories and talking about how I got through things in my life. And, and it just actually made me a better leader. But the, the, the side benefit, it made people talk to me more hmm. and it just created a culture that was just very authentic. It's not why I did it. I actually did it because I was just tired of faking it. And it had a great impact. And it taught me that people really do want to be themselves and they will connect with you if they know you are real and they know that you are vulnerable. Sadie, you had, um, and we talked about this very openly on the show, I mean, given that you run a, a business, a fitness business, I mean, the fitness industry got hit so hard over the last 15 months. Um, and you had to be very real with your team and with your franchise owners. I mean, you had to basically level with them and explain what was going on. And that, that must have been really hard. Yeah. Um, when it, about a year ago, I took a sabbatical, which uh, is kind of counterintuitive. <laughs> but i just knew i needed to step away and um take a deep breath and um learn about black lives matter and myself it was a huge reckoning moment for me and at first our owners were upset that i left it was like how could you leave leave us right now right and that is a very real um you know the optics around that probably weren't great and I had to really honor that and recognize that. And then, so we got on an all company call and I told them that, you know, I learned in that moment, the importance of my mental health and that in order for me to lead and be brave and to get uncomfortable with them around equity, diversity, and inclusion around the chaotic climate we were in, you know, losing 60% of our revenue out overnight, um, I had, to get well and that it i would i invite i said i hope this is an invitation for you to do the same thing and to not feel like you have to hold it together all the time um the the it was you know i and i did have guilt around it i had shame around it um but ultimately i think it's the best thing i could have done and um you know i suppose a moment of a true vulnerability um just recognizing that i needed to step back that way and I, I am really glad i did it and you and you sent your people a message it's okay not to be okay yeah and and people need to know that because i mean that's how we end up with you know with, with illnesses with you know people having nervous breakdowns with uh, stress related illnesses uh guy you know i'm a stage three colon cancer survivor yes. all kind of things happen um where you just have to step back and let people know it is okay. And I, I call it PMS, physical, mental, and spiritual health. We all need to have it. And we all need to focus on all three at the same time. And so I try to practice that. I told my team the other day, I said, when we bounce this last ball, I am on my way somewhere because I need a break. And they know I'm the energizer bunny. I'm always this. We don't know where you get your energy. Well, you know what? It's just about gone. <laughs> and so I need a break too. It's okay to tell people when you need a break. 
And so I applaud you, Sadie, for what you did. I absolutely applaud uh, what you did. Uh, we all need to think about that. It sends a great message. You know, uh, I'm wondering, Che, you, you gave a TED Talk um, a couple of years ago. It's super fun. If you if you haven't seen this TED Talk, you should check it out. Um, it was uh, at, at a, an event in Toronto. And uh, you talked about how you learned to stop being a micromanager, which is really understandable, right? It's your baby. You started this company. Sadie, you started your company. Sint, you are so experienced as a leader and a manager. Um, but we all know that micromanaging, it can be a human instinct, but it can also be an incredibly destructive instinct that that can hinder our own personal growth and the growth of the business and, and, and also the, 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 the the happiness and, the, and it can damage the culture. So first, Che, how did you learn to let go and to stop micromanaging and trying to tinker with every part of the business? It's so hard because like you said, you know, you bring it up, it's like your baby and you just want to, you know exactly how it should be in your mind. And a lot of founders, a lot of leaders are, are very gut driven. Uh, and so you just kind of know your gut says, no, that's not how it should look. Or that's not how we should pack a box. But if you step back and actually think about it rationally, um, no one in the history of humankind has ever said, I love to be micromanaged. And my best <laughs> boss, you know, how I got the most production was when my, my boss micromanaged me to the point that I really got it. That's never been said in humankind history, you know, human history. Uh, and then also on the flip side, you know, it's so counterintuitive that we go out and try to hire these folks from the best schools, uh, from the best, uh, you know, with the best experience only to try to tell them exactly what to do and how to do it. And so when you think about it that way, like your rational self really tells you that micromanaging just is not the best way to get the most production out of folks, but it's really distancing yourself for once away from your gut instinct of just wanting it the right way uh, and thinking about it for a second that, you know, micromanaging just doesn't make sense no matter how you, how you break it down. You know, I'm curious about this, and I, and I want to kind of push back for a moment. And, and Sint, I want to pose this question to you because mm -hmm. I think I have to imagine this is something all leaders struggle with. Sometimes you have to be the decider. You have to make a decision, and sometimes you're going to make it, oftentimes you're going to make a decision that not everybody is aligned with, that will right. upset some people, but, but you've got to make that decision, and it creates friction. Yes, and and I, I and, and it happens. I, I, I do it often uh, because I mean, but the 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 foundation of it all for me is trust. That if you have a foundation of trust, and it takes a while to build it, it takes a while for people to understand everybody's intentions. But once you build that foundation of trust, when you make that decision, people know that it's in the best interest of uh, the organization. Or when you're micromanaging, if you have that foundation of trust, the response uh, will be, oh, you just can't help yourself. Okay. And, and they can tolerate you. If they don't trust you, then they think you don't trust them. Why are you micromanaging? Why are you in my business? All that. Uh, because we, I mean, we all micromanage just to some degree. Uh, but it's the foundation of trust. And, and that's what we are really trying to build. We're going to focus on that a lot in the off season. I just, I just feel like there's a need to. We've been kind of away and I've, I've seen some things that uh, develop uh, because we want to be in a place where uh, you, you can deal with that friction. Uh, and, and it really does go back to trust. I make decisions almost every day where somebody is not happy and you have to do what's in the best interest of your customers, your employees and people understand that. And, and for the most part, I will say in our environment, People understand that. I've been on some calls with the leaders. They'll call me and say, Sent, we need you to kind of referee something. You, you, you're gonna have to make the decision. And we'll get on, you know, Microsoft Teams and they're on the screen and they'll both tell, and these are my leaders who report to me and they'll tell their side of the story and they'll say, okay, Sent, we need you to decide this. That's actually very healthy, I think. And nobody's mad when it's, when it's all over because they've worked through it, their teams have worked through it, and they decided I needed to work through it and I need to come up with the answer. And that's okay. They trust me, I trust them. For all of you, I mean, you're all so experienced. You've all, you're so invested in, in where you are working, what you've created, whether it's a culture or a business. How do you stay, how do you keep yourself honest? How do you make sure that the that the team around you can tell you when you 
you're not doing a good job or when you're making a mistake. I mean, especially when you are a leader, you have power and, and or you're perceived to have power, whether you don't see it yourself, whether or not you see it yourself. So, Sint, let me start with you. How do you how do you keep yourself um, in check? Well, first of all, uh, when well, my husband, he, he helps keep me in check because I will ask him. I mean, sometimes yeah. I'll run something by him and I'll say, what do you think about that? He said, you need to give them an opportunity to tell you kind of what they're really thinking. People might be holding them back. So he, he's very good that way if I run something by him. Uh, I also try to make sure I have a variety of people around our leadership team table and around their tables and people who will not hesitate to tell us when we're off. And I will ask the question. I mean, I will ask the question I, I, I had on the call today. I had some, some thoughts about uh, the vaccine and some things we need to do. I said, what do you guys think about that? And if they don't readily come out, I'll just start calling on them one by one. I said, talk to me. I mean, talk to me. I want you guys to tell me because I could be off here. Let's talk about this. And then sometime it'll take a minute and then everybody starts talking and then we'll just say, OK, let's mix it all up and we'll come back and revisit them. I mean, revisit this. I think we have to invite it. And then we have to make sure that uh, when people have spoken up, that there's no retaliation and no consequences because that's that's no negative consequences because that's the easiest way uh, to shut it down. And so yeah. I actually will lift up the people who have challenged us, who have brought something to our attention. I will lift them up publicly and thank them uh, for doing that and thanking and thank them for getting us back on course and thank them uh, for challenging me. Sadie, how about you? I mean, you, you also work with Chris, your husband, he's a co-founder, but you've got a team around you. How do you, how do you stay in check? Well, I've learned that the most rich and rewarding professional relationships are one where we can establish safe space to check each other, mutually, respectfully do it. And I invite that and I've learned to invite it often uh, because when things build up, that's when it when when it can get bad. Um, and that's when we do lose trust, um, you know, as colleagues. I do think that um, it's important to realize in my role that I no one can fire me. I'm the founder. I have complete ownership of Bar3. It's my job to kind of fire myself. If, if I'm not taking the time to investigate, where do I need to improve? Um, you know, did I show up with our core values today? Um, am I asking the right questions? You know, oh, I'm falling back into that pattern where I'm interrupting. I'm going to work on that. You know, I have a dialogue with myself because I know no one can fire me. I have to fire myself in all those moments. And my team knows that. I talk about this openly with them. Um, and, and again, I think the most rewarding relationships are the ones where we'll have a hearty argument and a, you know, a battle about something and then laugh it off later and, and move on. Che, um, I, I, I'm curious because a, a question, and I want, I want to ask all of you this question. We are often asked by our listeners for guidance and help when it comes to probably the hardest thing a leader has to do which is to acknowledge that maybe a person they hired is not the right pick. Um, and maybe they have to let that person go. And that happens. It happens very, it happens in, in the earliest phases of a startup. It can happen well into the startup. It can happen years into the business growing and scaling where you really, it's time to let somebody go. It's very, very hard. Um, I have to imagine all three of you have been through that. Um, che, how do you, is there a good way? Is there is there a way? A what's your advice about letting people go? You know, I, I um, I'd have to say I've learned the hard way. Uh, you know, it's probably a skill set that uh, at, at least for me and and um, some of the folks I've talked to, it's not it's not innate in me to be ruthless. And the minute I, I hear something I don't like, it's um, you know that I have a button under my table where that person falls through the floor, and <laughs> you know uh, we're, we're going to replace the VP of whatever. You know. Um, so it's not in my, my soul to do that, but I've learned the hard way that, that it's unhealthy, uh, keeping folks too long and, and thinking that, oh, you know, just another month or just another quarter. And, and I really feel like they're going to be able to turn the corner. I, you know, uh, often more time, more often than not, that, that just never happens. And I think what I've learned is that, um, and for those folks, uh, uh, watching and listening out there, 
Um, uh, so know that I've learned the hard way. And if you ask leaders all around the country and the world, most likely they'll say the same thing is that uh, if anything, like keeping folks too long is really bad, not only for the company, but also for that employee or for that uh, 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 kind of team member. Um, you would think you're doing them a favor by keeping them employed or that by trying to reform them and by trying to fix the situation. But eventually what happens is that you're beginning to, you'll, you'll begin to stunt their career. So time that they could have, you know, spent at a place that was really for them where they could flourish uh, was time when they were just, uh, um, uh, you know, putzing about like uh, at, at this, per in this particular position where they weren't a great fit and they were no longer learning anything. And so, um, uh, so every time I've looked back, I've never once said, oh, thank gosh, it took us so long to kind of part ways with someone. It's always been, you know, afterwards, usually they're relieved, we're relieved as well, and everyone parts ways on, on, on kind of uh, a, a different trajectory, but both on a good trajectory. Sin? I agree with that. I think timing is everything, and so I like to give people notice. I mean, the minute I start to feel like it's not a good match, and it's not just a feeling, you have to have data to back it up. Uh, so the, the minute I have that data and I have that feeling, I like to sit down with them and say, uh, this doesn't seem like it's a good match. And let me tell you where I'm struggling, what, what I'm seeing and where I'm struggling. So it's not even about them at that point. It's about me and the, the disconnect that I'm having. And so we start to talk through that. And then I like to set out some timelines. And if, it, if it's 90 days, let's take a look at this. Let's continue to check in. Because part of giving that notice is, uh, you want them to really start thinking about it too, because if they need to go somewhere else, you want to give them time to get another job and 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 and, and start that process. Because you know people you know need, need you know they they need work, but sometimes that is not a good fit where they are right then. So I like to give notice, and then the last thing I like to do is ask them when it's time to go. How do you want to do this? I want to do it in a way that that works for them. So how do you want to do this? You know you want to come in later and get your stuff. Uh, you know, let's come up with some lines. What do we want to tell people? I want people to leave with dignity um, and, and, and just kind of plan it out. And you can't take too long because they when the, once you know it's not a good fit, usually they know it's not a good fit. Yeah. And everybody else knows that, too. And so then you're sending a bad message to your folks if you're tolerating uh, something like that. Now, that's if it's not bad behavior. If it's bad behavior, misconduct and ethical violation, code of conduct violation, that's immediate. Yeah. But in the in the usually it's not a good fit. Sadie? I completely agree with um, both responses. I would add that um, moving upstream take a while to hire. I, I take it very seriously when we hire someone. Um, that you know, they will be set up for boundless success, um, you know, really thrive in our culture. Um, not necessarily someone who's um, needs bar three and just is like a beloved client, for example, although that's amazing as long as they're also going to really add value to bar three. I think for a while there, I was trending towards um, hiring people because they were so endeared to the brand. And, and in the, in the long view, that didn't really serve them. Um, you know, finding people who had the skill who maybe questioned what we were doing and wanted to move us forward um, tends to be the team members who stay the longest, who are the happiest and have a longer life with us. The other, the other um, quote I have from my friend Kim Malik um, that I love is let them outgrow me. You know, have them, let, let this be an experience for them where they can build their skills, build their confidence and then outgrow and move on and be really, really okay with that. I love that. Um, this year, this past year, has been incredibly challenging for leaders, in part because of remote work. I mean, all of you have, to some extent, I know, Che, you, you were going in a lot, but to some extent, you've had to lead via Zoom or, or via video link. Um, and, and we've all heard uh, uh, stories all across the country of how disruptive that's been. Um, I think it's also accelerated a desire, a demand, and I think rightfully so, among employees um, to to have more say in in you know in their work environments, um, to have more power in how work in their lives are structured. What have you learned this past year trying to lead through video, trying to maintain morale, trying to be a great leader? 
I mean, it's com a completely new environment. So what what did you learn that you think will make you a better leader in a post truly post pandemic environment? Yeah, I, I love that. I came up with something. I can't remember if we talked about it last time. And this was probably a good uh, month or two into the pandemic. And I realized that my priorities as a leader had changed and the things that I was spending my time on um, kind of shifted. And so I ended up calling it my new dot com and it C O M and it was compassion, community, com uh, uh, communication, compliance and compromise. And I'll just hit the first three. It was all about compassion. Uh, and I always talk about meeting employees where they are and all of that. It really, really became a focus for me because people were going through so much. Some people all of a sudden had kids at home that they had to school. Their roles had changed. It was just crazy. And so I realized part of what I needed to do was have a lot of compassion for people in their individual circumstances and demonstrate that and then try to help. Uh, the same with the uh, uh, community. Uh, even though we weren't playing the game of basketball, I told my team, we're playing the game of life with people and with each other. And the sense of community uh, has to elevate. Uh, and then our communication had to go uh, to new heights. Uh, we thought we were great communicators, but now all of a sudden we, we are remote. So what kind of structure do we actually need to put in place to help us uh, communicate on a regular basis? And what kind of things do we naturally communicate on in the office, but now we need to set up that structure. And I had to be very diligent about that. Our leadership team had to be very diligent about that. And so we're going to carry that into uh, in, to kind of this new world. The things that we have put in place around those things, we're going to carry that forward. Um, the, 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 really, the lesson that I learned was really that um, if you think about um, kind of uh, everyone as, as being a battery, um, you know, battery A, battery B, both equally as effective once you put it into the camera or the machine. Um, what I've learned is that uh, by being completely remote, I think you discharge the battery at a, very, at a much faster rate. Um, and, and, you know, why do I, why do I say that? Um, I think at the very, for most folks, um, uh, at our very core, we're social human beings. Like we want to see each other. We want to once in a while banter in the coffee room. We want to know how people's kind of weekends were and go out for a random coffee or a random mm -hmm. lunch. And so being in person, not all the time, but even some of the time I found discharges that battery um, at a slower rate. And so um, you also find that what's really damaging towards kind of that discharge of that battery is also when you have a heated Zoom meeting where folks have differing points of view, as we often do running businesses, there's no repair uh, time. And so there's no time to say, hey, after the meeting's over, that was a really contentious meeting. You got a minute in the hallway mm -hmm. or, hey, do you wanna go grab a coffee afterwards? Yeah. There's no repair time. You go off onto your next Zoom, which you're probably two minutes late for, um, and it kind of festers over and over again. And so I think um, definitely what I learned is that you do need that human interaction and that by going full remote, you can be as effective, but that battery just seems to discharge a little bit faster. Wow. I would just add that what I've learned is um, more of an affirmation around the power of having true purpose and a strong vision and mission. When chaos strikes, um, you know, we had remarkable constraints, um, but we had a strong purpose and vision and essential problems we we're solving. And because of that, I'm so proud of what this team, our team has done here at the home office in Portland, but also all of our owners all across the country in Canada and Manila, all over um, together problem solving. And one of our core values is stronger together. And I really think that that value was present this year, just also letting go and letting all these people problem solve in their own way versus you know having one answer at our headquarters. Um, it's a huge lesson. I love it. Sadie Lincoln of Bar 3, Che Huang of Boxed, and Sint Marshall of the Dallas Mavericks. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Thanks awesome. Thanks for having us. And good luck tonight, Sint. Thank you. Go Mavs. All right. Go Mavs. And, and if you're a Clippers fan, uh, go Clippers. Um, we will be back in a few minutes with Brene Brown. We're going to talk Thank more you. about leadership. We will see you all in a few minutes. Stand by.